Abraham rescues Lot. At the time when Amraphel was king of Shinar, Arioch king of Elisa, Kedaralma king of Elam, and Tidal king of Goya, these kings went to war against Bera king of Sodom, Bersha king of Gomorrah, Shinab king of Adma, Shemeba king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoah. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the Dead Sea Valley. For 12 years, <clears throat> they had been subject to Kedarah Omer, but in the 13th year, they rebelled. In the 14th year, Kedarah Mala and the kings as allied with him went out and defeated the Rephala. Rephaites in Ashtaroth, Carnaim, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Shaveh, Kiriatham, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran near the desert. Then they turned back and went to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and they conquered the whole territory of the Amalekites as well as the Amorites who were living in Hazazon Amar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admar, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoah, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Sidim against Kedaral Lama, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyam, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisa, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits, and when the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abraham's nephew, Lot, and his possessions, since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abraham the Hebrew. Now Abraham was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Anah, all of whom were allied with Abraham. When Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abraham divided his men to attack them and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobar, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abraham returned from defeating Kedalima and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shavai, that is, the king's valley. Then Mikil Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the and I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the man who went with me. 
to Aina, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. This is the word of the Lord. Shall I pray for us? Uh, at the 9.15, we had a power cut while I was preaching, which was interesting. So I may pray that doesn't happen again. Uh, but let me pray for us. Uh, Father God, I thank you for this uh, chapter in Genesis. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to see your hand at work as the faithful God. And thank you that we have Abraham, uh, as we know, uh, a hero of faith who trusted in what is uh, unseen, not what is seen. Lord, may we too live as your faithful people uh, in this faithless world. Amen. Uh, well, my name's Harry. It's lovely you're with us this morning. I'm the curate here, and lovely to welcome those joining on live stream. Hopefully you've got Genesis 14 open, uh, which is wonderfully on page 14. If you're someone that finds that a joy, then you're overjoyed this morning. Um, but back to the text itself. Um, I want to start by saying what you might consider the blindingly obvious, uh, that life is just a bit messy. Uh, sometimes things go right and we celebrate that. But when I say things go wrong, I hope I'm not saying anything new. Uh, sometimes things just don't go the way we hoped. Our plans don't come to fruition. We go to the doctors and the test results aren't good. We may find that this world is just complicated. You know, just to live and drive a car, uh, to make sure the bills are paid, the, the right taxes are done, the right insurance is sorted. Uh, everything is, there's lots to everything, isn't there? There's all the technology we deal with, everything around us. And then it not only may we find our own uh, life messy, but we turn on the news and we just find the whole world sometimes feels like it's in chaos. And, and we may be here and you may follow Jesus. And so can I say to you, if you follow Jesus, that life is messy. Sometimes things go right and sometimes things go wrong. Your plans you make don't come to fruition and sometimes the test results are negative. Things are complicated and life is hard. Followers of Jesus get ill. They get old. They live in the messy world. They die. But what does it mean if we're people that do follow Jesus, if we do have God's promises? What does it mean to act in faith, to live as faithful people? As we come to this moment in the life and story of Abraham, we will see that in more detail. But first, let us get to grips with the messy situation that we find in our chapter uh, it's, it's confusing for a number of reasons. It's confusing because we can't say the names. It's confusing because we can't say the places. But I have just found a, a really helpful summary just from another Bible teacher that I'm going to read out called Jonathan Griffiths. I think he helpfully in a couple of sentences gets, it gives us a flavor of what we, what we need to understand and see that is going on from verses 14, 1 to 12. He writes... The little Canaanite kingdoms have been under the thumb of Chedidomar, who has led a coalition of foreign powers from Mesopotamia for a dozen years. The Canaanite kings eventually get tired of the situation and rebel. However, it does not go well for them. The Mesopotamian kings, led by Chedidomar, come back and crush them. The Canaanite kings then flee leaving the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to be plundered. So we heard it was four kings against five, uh, but the four kings won. We hear in verse 10, the Valley of Sidon was full of tar pits, so it's not only a messy situation, but now a sticky one. And when they flee, we find that people are captured. It's local politics of the time of the era. It's local rulers with their own people, it's oppression and conflict. It's just local politics. A bit more violent than maybe our local politics. Local politics, and it's all gone wrong. It's a bit of a mess. And in the middle of that mess, we find something quite significant. Verse 12, we may think that all this information is totally irrelevant to anything, to the life of Abraham. It's almost like it's happening next door, and we're just told about it. 
But then we find nephew, uh, his nephew Lot, sorry, not nephew, Abraham's nephew Lot, and his possessions have been taken as well since he was living in Sodom. Lot started by living near Sodom, and now it looks like he's moved in. Uh, in chapter 13, we're told that this is probably, uh, well, definitely foolish, as we hear about Sodom and the evil. And there he is, and he is taken off. Now, what at this point is Abraham going to do? Indeed, what do we make of all this? We started our journey in Abraham hearing these big promises of the Lord, saying to him, go from your country, chapter 12, verse 1, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. I think sometimes when we think of the story of the Bible, even when maybe I've, points I've preached on it, we go, here are the promises to Abraham. Uh, here they sort of happen later on. Here's Jesus. Here's us. But as we get into the nitty gritty of the kind of life of Abraham, of this journey he's on, we find that it wasn't just a click of the fingers. And Abraham finds himself in the land with lots of people. At chapter 14, he is still childless. The people promise is going well. Uh, he's in the land, but we're told there's just lots of other people living there. Uh, 13, verse 7, the Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. Uh, he's, he's still living just in a tent, so he's, he's, not, he's still quite nomadic. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, you might say, well... What about these promises? In, indeed, in that situation, you know, we might be tempted to think, well, God, are you going to come through? It's, it's probably been a bit of time since Genesis 12, since he heard that promise. Uh, we'll find that there's a bit more time and he still uh, doesn't have a child. You might think, well, okay, this God made some big promises but things have just got messy, chaotic. Everything's going wrong. He's 75, a few more years older probably now. And he finds that his nephew's been captured. They're all going off next door. What does he do? What does he do? Is he going to trust God? And just as, obviously we see that Abraham does. That the answer is yes, he does. But just for a moment, I want us to see and to acknowledge that the life of faith for Abraham, who didn't end up seeing all the promises fulfilled, wasn't easy either. It wasn't like he, you know, he, it was rosy for him the whole way. We find he makes mistakes. We find that there's chaos around him. We find that it doesn't happen immediately. We, we, we see in Abraham, as, as we're sort of told about in, in Hebrews, we see a life of faith. But in some respects, we don't see this kind of uh, perfect picture of faith. We see the life of faith of someone who trusts in God through the unseen uh, ways that God will work. God ultimately will prove himself faithful to Abraham. And Abraham it proves uh, uh, he trusts in the unseen but let me say that, that if we follow Jesus here this morning, we cannot expect a life free from the mess and the chaos. It's not how it works. As Christians, we will face things that are hard, that are painful, that hurt. Now, we'll see that Jesus is the great rescuer. But I can't promise anyone here today that by trusting in Jesus, suddenly your life will flip a switch and it will all be easy. As if you'll cruise through the next years of your life, to a happy old age. It's not what it's like. It's not what it is. That's not what the life of faith means. Abraham finds himself in the messiest of situations. His nephew is only closest relative, maybe the one who might some way fulfill this line, this, this family line promise. It's captured. Just messy. But in the next part, as we see Abraham as he acts, we will see of a God who is faithful, a God who provides a gracious rescue. And in some respect, that takes up the next half, 13 onwards to the end. 
Now, Abraham, as I've said, is still living uh, near these great trees in his tent. Someone comes and tells him what's happened. And you can imagine for a moment, maybe he just thinks, Lot, you know, you made your choice. But instead, Abraham acts, and he goes off to rescue him. Now, uh, Abraham clearly is nomadic, but he's not sort of, sometimes you have the, I don't know, maybe it's just me. You had this picture of Abraham as this kind of, and Sarah just on their own. Uh, clearly, he's not exactly on his own because he has 318 trained men, trained men as well as all the resources he has. Um, so he, he takes them with him. But even then, we might think that the odds are not in his favor. Four kings and 318. Now, I don't, we've got to be careful here. Obviously, it's unlikely that when we think of four kings, we're thinking of the, the might of, you know, four nation states of today, but the mass is, is against him. And yet Abraham, in what we might call a stroke of military genius, verse 15, divides his men in the night, a sneak attack, a surprise, a pincer movement, we might say, and he routes them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. And in doing so, he recovers all the goods and, and brought back his relative lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. And if the chapter ended here, we might look at Abraham and go, wow, what a guy. What a, what a nephew. Or, you know, what a, sorry, no, he's not my uncle. What, you know, what, he, he comes for his nephew. What a, what, a, what a guy. What a military genius. What, a, what an amazing general. But actually we find that the chapter doesn't end here. Because some people pop up on the scene, and specifically... Uh, We'll come to them in more detail, but for this moment, we need to hear the words of Melchizedek. He arrives along with the king of Sodom, uh, having heard about what has happened. And Melchizedek says, and praise to God, be to God most high, verse 20, who delivered your enemies into your hands. See, who was at work as Abraham went out? Who was at work in his plan and his strategy? Was it just that Abraham was the great general? No, it was God who was working his plans, who was using Abraham to rescue Lot. And and Abraham, in doing so, rescued other people as well. The people of Sodom, who had also been taken captive, the blessing to nations that Abraham is, as he rescues the people of Sodom as well. Not just Lot, but others as well. And we find, actually, that it is meant to help us to see that here God was at work rescuing people. Now, if we think about the gospel picture of rescue, we we think about and look ahead to Jesus, the great rescuer, the great deliverer, the one who tied up the strong man so that sinful people can go free. The one who died on the cross, bearing the punishment we should have borne so that we might be forgiven and restored. The great rescuer, the great deliverer. See, in this this kind of picture of rescue, this gospel picture, we need to remember that we, all of us, were in need of rescue. When we did the book of Mark, we found out that It was impossible for us to save ourselves. As Peter cried out, who then can be saved? For us, impossible. Apart from the grace of God in Christ. And so if if this morning you, you suddenly recognize that you are trapped, that you cannot make yourself right, that the weight of sin and the guilt that brings bears heavy, that we are rebels against our Creator. He offers a rescuer, a deliverer, a mighty Savior. He offers us the Lord Jesus, who, if we turn to with repentance and faith, if we confess our weakness, our helplessness, our rebellion against our Creator, and turn to Jesus, we find forgiveness. And salvation. There is a rescuer. There is a savior. In this 
gospel picture that we see in Genesis of a rescue, we can look to Jesus and see a gracious rescue, undeserved. We're less like Lot and Abraham, but perhaps more like the other people. Undeserving, but finding in Jesus one who offers us forgiveness. Finding grace in the one sent to die to save us. But Abraham also, as the book of Hebrews tells us, is a picture of faith, of trusting in the unseen. And so we also need to ask ourselves our question, how is Abraham faithful in this situation? How does he give us a picture of what it means to trust in, the God, in God and his promises, to follow Jesus by faith? Well, in some respect, we see that ultimately in the reaction he has to Melchizedek and the king of Sodom. So while they're both there, Melchizedek goes first. He comes forward. He's a priest of God Most High and a king. Uh, He's actually the king of righteousness. That's what his name means. Melchizedek is like two Hebrew words mushed together, which actually means king of righteousness. Uh, And king of Salem is a bit shalom, may come to mind. Peace, again, his his name is giving us clues about him. Uh, He blesses Abraham, and Abraham gives him a tenth of everything. He honors Melchizedek. He recognizes he is in the presence of someone great. And he refuses. He refuses the king of Sodom. The king of Sodom then has his turn, comes and speaks to Abraham. Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Anna, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. It's interesting, isn't it? The king of Sodom comes and says, you know, I want my people back, but you can have the stuff. But what would happen if Abraham took it? Well, we see his name would have been made great by Sodom as he sort of accepted the things of the world, as he's accepted from this king of a people we're told are wicked. His name would have been made great by someone other than God. His wealth would have been given not by the Lord, but by this king. And at that moment, if we turn back to Genesis 12, we might think that the promises of God were ringing at Abraham's ear. As it says in 12 verse 2, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Indeed, in the few verses after our chapter, chapter 15, if Abraham was worried that he might end up in poverty or that he will not have enough, after this moment, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, 15 verse 1, in a vision, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. See, Abraham had a choice. He could honor Melchizedek, who comes as God's man, the priest, the king, a great one. Or he could just trust in the gifts of a wicked king, see what was there and and take it. Maybe as a cover, as as an insurance policy, Just in case God doesn't come through. Just in case God doesn't prove faithful. But of course, Abraham has seen God's faith. God is faithful, sorry, as he delivered Abraham. And so Abraham exercises faith as he honors God's man in this moment, Melchizedek. Now, the author of the Hebrews, as I turn to Hebrews just for a moment, Uh, spends time helping us to see that Melchizedek uh, is great. I'm just going to read one verse from chapter 7. This is about Melchizedek. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Melchizedek is great. He's the king of righteousness, the king of peace. He's a priest of God most high. But there is someone greater the one who's rescued people, the one who's the author 
and pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the one we're called to fix our eyes on, the Lord Jesus. See, those who are acting in faith look to him, honor Jesus, demonstrate our allegiance to him in our life as we trust in the promises of God. So this is what we need to do. We need to honor God's Messiah, Jesus. We need to honor his man, the Lord Jesus Christ. But how? I'm sure you can almost feel the tension, right? Life is messy. We need to honor God. God is faithful. Life is messy. Every day you we're playing this out, and every day you wake up and you find the rea- the, you wake up to the reality of life is messy. God is faithful. I, I, I want to live for Jesus. If I've received the salvation, I live for Jesus. Well, I thought. I try as best to give an example of how this passage has spoke to me, and maybe in my wrestlings of what it means to be faithful to God in a situation that I will admit right now is not the hardest situation in this church family. It's not the most difficult or messy or challenging situation by any means. But I hope as you see how it's spoken to me, you might have a go at wrestling yourself to what it means for you to be faithful. To trust God, to trust in the things unseen, not what is seen. Now I'm a curate, and that means uh, that I thought it was right that it was I'd have to move on from Holy Trinity at some point, to step out in faith. But I'll be honest, that is quite unsettling. When you don't know where you'll be, where you'll live, or what your job will be, um, it's difficult. It's unsettling in the small things as you wonder how many jumpers to buy your children for the school term, recognizing they might be in that school for one term or two. It's unsettling when you look at a role, another post, and you think you have to imagine your life there where you don't know the schools or the area or the parks or the people or the shops. You imagine yourself how you might serve that church and you you pray and hope, and I sort of pray for the big red arrow to drop out the sky and go, that one. You may have prayed those prayers about other things. It's unsettling at home when every conversation reverts back to the same thing. When your mind is occupied by what will happen in the future, I don't know. I don't know. What does it mean to act in faith in those moments? I'm not holding myself up here as a model example. As you can hear, I, this is it's not easy for me either. But as I've wrestled with that, these are some of the things I've found. And it's odd, whenever I talk to some people about this situation, I find myself concluding that I should preach my own sermons to myself. So this is me preaching my sermon to myself. What would I say if I was where you were? Well, I would say, God has made promises. He's made promises to us, not for ease or comfort, but in Romans he tells us he will make us more like Jesus. So my heart is longing for me to pray that my character will be shaped by my period of waiting, that, I, that I'll become more like Jesus in patience, in obedience, in trust, in hope. My prayer is that I'll see God's faithfulness more clearly, that I'll see him working in and through the situation. I confess that the situation makes me self-focused, stuck in my head, which can lead to distance from my wife and children. So I ask for forgiveness and for God to change me, to help me to keep loving my family well. I pray that I won't see it as an opportunity to step back from here for the ministry God has given me, for the opportunities here that I won't just spin in my chair because I know I'm leaving, that I'll just like do random things and then walk away, that I'll continue to care and love the people God has given me right here. That ultimately I would honor Jesus, fix my eyes on him and live for him day by day. These are the things I think through as I think about what it means to be faithful in my situation. And I'm encouraging you, whatever chaos you're in, 
whatever mess is there, however much it's a moment of weeping, of joy, of whatever it is, keep asking yourself, well, if you're not sure, ask someone else. How can I be faithful? How can I keep fixing my eyes on Jesus? I want to encourage you that Abraham saw God's faithfulness to him as he, uh, as he delivered the enemies into his hands. That you would see the faithfulness of God in Christ as he came to save you from your sins. And that you would trust in what is unseen. That the promises of slow, small change in this life, not perfection. That the promises of eternal life, of a new creation, of, of being adopted into the family of Jesus would be more wonderful and compelling that as you see his faithfulness, you would prayerfully live by faith and not by sight. Let me pray for us. Father God, as, as we see here the, the messiness of life for Abraham as he heard those promises, but as chaos seemed to in, in come along, as we see how you were faithful in delivering uh, his enemies, of, of enabling Abraham to rescue Lot, as we know your faithfulness in Jesus, and as we long to respond in faith, of fixing our eyes on the unseen, of fixing our eyes on Jesus, as we seek to live for him, well, may you help us to do so. Help us, Lord, to keep trusting, uh, to keep longing to honor you, to keep demonstrating our allegiance to Christ as we honor him. For your glory. Amen.